Hi, this is Alex. In this video I'm going to demonstrate how I paint this picture using oil paint and the alla prima method of painting, which simply means that I'm going to be painting wet on wet in one sitting. This painting took me a little over an hour to complete and I'm going to show you the entire process in real time start to finish. So, get comfortable and let's get into it. In this video I also recorded my palette so you can see exactly what colors I'm using. I will say that when I'm painting my first priority is the painting and not the video. I don't really do live commentary as I paint because I find it distracting and I try to set up my camera in such a way that it doesn't interfere with my work. And in this case I've set up the camera above my painting pointed at my palette so whenever I'm painting you'll see my hand kind of swinging in the foreground of the video of the palette video. Uh, so I apologize if that's a little distracting but I'm hoping you can get used to it quickly. I make these videos in the hope that they may be helpful to some people just learning how to paint. If you find this video helpful and uh, you'd like me to make more leave a comment and give it a thumbs up. Alright so on my palette I've put out some titanium white, cadmium yellow light, yellow ochre, alizarin crimson, burnt sienna, burnt umber, chromium green, and ultramarine blue. I don't usually like to paint with black because I can just mix ultramarine and burnt umber and just make any temperature black that I want. So I've started out by mixing some burnt umber and linseed oil to make my drawing. I'm just gonna do a very simple composition with a tomato right in the middle and just allow that cloth that sits underneath it to add a little bit visual interest to the painting. I want to talk a little bit about painting mediums. For anyone who is just starting out in painting, a medium is simply what you mix into the paint to make it more liquid. Uh, you can uh, use the paint as it comes out of the tube uh, and create some very thick expressive brush strokes, but uh, uh, if you want to have uh, more control over your paint, you'll need to mix it with something. I just use pure linseed oil as my painting medium, and the reason for that is that I paint in my house where my family and I live, so I don't want fumes to enter the house. Uh, artist quality linseed oil is perfectly safe and produces no toxic fumes. If you don't care about fumes, uh, there are several other options that are better than just pure linseed oil. If I'm painting a, a landscape outside, for example, I will use mineral spirits for the drawing uh, and the initial layer of paint, uh, which penetrates the gesso much better than linseed oil. And after that, I'll use a mixture of equal parts turpentine, linseed oil, and Damar varnish as my medium. And then the beauty uh, of this mixture is that it flows really nicely and adheres to the surface well and after the turpentine evaporates it becomes a little sticky uh, from the Damar varnish which makes it easier to work back into it with fresh paint. You can also use liquin uh, which makes the paint dry a lot faster but I just really hate the smell of this stuff even outside and I think when you're painting it should be a pleasant experience. All that said, if you're just starting out and you've set up a studio in your bedroom or living room or something, just get yourself some linseed oil and that's all you need. Okay, so I've uh, blocked in the general drawing and I'm pretty happy with it. If you do make a mistake in the overall composition, now would be the time to correct it. Just uh, dip a rag in some oil and wipe the drawing away. You definitely don't want to try to fix the structure of the painting later when you have a lot more paint on the canvas. Okay, so the next thing I do is block in my shadows using the same color as the drawing. It's good to get those darkest darks uh, in the very beginning so you don't have to fight with the lighter paint later on. So I can see that that bottom part of the tomato is went a little bit too high so I'm just gonna use the the rag just to wipe that down before I block in my shadows on the tomato. So the tomato is sitting on a white cloth and you might be 
and wondering why I'm using this kind of brown, intense brown paint to paint the shadows on the cloth, which is going to be white. And the reason for that is simply that, you know, I have this paint ready and I'm just going to do my overall drawing. And that's it. And later on, I can adjust it, I can modify it a little bit, but my darkest darks are probably going to remain as brown. And that actually gives the painting a little bit more life. So now I'm going to block in the background. I'm mixing some ultramarine blue with burnt umber to make a sort of a dark gray. This will uh, create a good base uh, color for the background. I'm going to modify it with a little bit of uh, other colors later on. But right now I just want to tone that background down. So it looks like I went over the contour of the tomato a little bit with the dark background color, so I'm just going to wipe that down a little bit. And while I have the rag, I think I'm going to go ahead and lighten up that shadow just a little bit. Just rub that paint in a little bit into the, into the surface of the board. Next for the table, I'm mixing up some burnt umber, ultramarine blue, some burnt sienna, and a uh, bit of yellow ochre, and maybe some cadmium red. A lot of times the color you mix up on the palette looks different on the painting, so you just have to get uh, a bit on there and adjust as needed. Clearly that's too dark but it looks pretty good for the shadow color. Now I'm gonna brighten it up with some cadmium yellow, some more yellow ochre, burnt sienna, and yeah uh, it's gonna need a little bit of white too. Now it looks a little bit too bright on the palette, but uh, looks about right once you put on the painting. Now I'm keeping things very loose at this stage. My goal is to just cover the panel with color that is similar to what I see. And it's kind of hard to judge if the colors are right until you have something to compare it to. So as long as you still have white on the canvas, you may not be able to tell if the color is right or if it needs to be adjusted. Now that I can see the edge between the table and the background, I want to adjust uh, the background a little bit to make it more opaque. I'm mixing up some ultramarine blue, burnt umber, uh, titanium white with yellow ochre, 
uh, to make sort of a warm gray. And even though it looks lighter than it uh, than the initial color and that I put down in the background, because it's more opaque, it does not allow the white of the panel to show through. So when I put it down, it actually looks darker. I'm going to darken it up even more with some ultramarine blue and burnt umber. I'm also going to vary up the color in the background a bit to introduce some new colors. I'm adding some alizarin crimson uh, to make it warmer, make it sort of a brown. And uh, by adding more and more white with umber, I can get it closer to the base background so it doesn't jump out as much. I'm also going to create a sort of a purple by adding some ultramarine blue and white to the mix. And the reason to do this is to add some visual interest to the background. I used to paint my backgrounds in a simple solid color and just uh, look for light variations. And then I looked at some of the works of the masters like Monet or Cezanne. Uh, if you look uh, from far away, a color may just look gray or white or blue, but if you come closer to the painting and you really examine it, you see all kinds of colors playing against each other. So the question is, what colors do you use if your background is gray? I suggest that you just paint it the gray that you see first, and then compare what your what's on your painting to what you see in the scene. And a lot of times you'll notice some differences. You know, some areas may look a little bit cooler than your painting. So just mix up a blue that is tonally similar to the background color, to the gray that you had already, and uh, add that to the to the scene. And you might see some areas that are a little warmer. So mix up a, you know, a red or a reddish brown that looks similar in tone also. And all those colors will begin to play up against each other and create a nice little harmony. Okay, so the cloth is white, but you can't just use pure white. That should be reserved for just the highlights. So I've mixed up some titanium white with some ultramarine blue and yellow ochre to create a bit of a gray, kind of a slightly blue-green gray. And uh, because I'm not using black, the color is uh, interesting to begin with and has some variations to it already. And every time I mix up a new, new gray, it's a little different. So that also adds to the visual interest of the painting. For the shadow of the cloth, I'm uh, going to use the same three colors, but add some burnt umber and burnt sienna to warm up the color and pull it away from the green a little bit. At this stage, I only need two colors to establish the overall areas of light and dark. Later, I can fine-tune the halftones and add accents and highlights and all that stuff.
now that there's paint everywhere on the painting except the main subject, let's go ahead and get started on that. I like to work on the main subject once I have the background in because it's really a lot easier to get the colors and the values right once you have something to compare it to. I'm mixing some uh, yellow ochre, cadmium red, and a little bit of cadmium green, or chromium green actually, to subdue the intensity of the color. Uh, I'm also going to throw in a little bit of white to lighten things up. If you see that your colors are getting a little muddy, uh, just add back some pure colors. I've added some uh, alizarin crimson here as well, uh, more yellow ochre and a bit of green, again to darken it. And this is going to be my basic shadow color. Oops, there's a little crumb. Gotta get rid of that. So it's actually very similar to the wash of burnt umber that I put down there to begin with, but I need something that's a little more opaque. And everywhere I see that dark color, I'm just gonna block it in. Not worrying too much about the exact drawing right now yet. Just trying to block in the overall shape. And actually that color uh, changes a little bit as you go up on the tomato and you can see that a little bit of um, the actual yellow of the tomato, the orange of the tomato gets reflected into the shadow up there. Uh, so I want that to be a little bit more uh, intense and rich. And uh, within the shadow, there's also the reflected light uh, that bounces off the white cloth and onto the bottom of the tomato. I'm using some cadmium yellow mixed uh, with the existing mixture that I had. And I'm going to use that for the reflected light on the tomato. And that same color can actually be used for middle tone. Uh, that little edge between the light and shadow on the tomato. I might as well use it while I have it on my paintbrush. Now it's time to mix up the light color of the tomato. I'm using a different brush so I can keep my dark colors on one brush and uh, my light colors on the other and just bounce between the two as I work. So I'm uh, picking up a little cadmium orange, a little bit of cad yellow and some white and I'm gonna mix in a little bit of um, yellow ochre into it as well just to dull the color down just a little bit. And sometimes um, sometimes you think you get the color right and you keep mixing it on the palette and as soon as you put it on the painting you realize it's not quite right. So you don't really need to spend that much time mixing your colors on the palette. Just get on the painting and see if it looks right. So you can probably see that that's not quite right. That looks a little too dark. Now how would you fix that? I'm going to lighten it up with some more white and cadmium yellow. And that initial color will still be useful, so I'm going to keep it on my palette and uh, maybe use it for middle tones. 
And what I'm showing you here is just the technique that I use for painting a realistic still life. This is a technique that I've found to be pretty effective over time in many different trials. That said, none of this should be taken as gospel. There is no wrong way to paint. Let me actually repeat that. There is no wrong way to paint. There are things you'll do in painting that will have certain outcomes. And if those are not the outcomes that you like, then you should paint differently. But those things that you do are not really mistakes. You see, when you're painting, you have all the decision-making power in your hands. You're almost like a god here. And you can lead the painting in any direction you want. If you're not happy with the end, then you can just scrape the whole thing off as if it didn't happen. Tell me, where else in your life do you have that kind of control? Of course, sometimes the painting will itself lead you in a certain direction. Uh, it'll allow you to make certain discoveries and show you things that you haven't known before. But in the end, you're the boss. So you should experiment and try things and see what happens. As that front plane on the tomato gets lower, it sort of turns away from the light and it gets darker. So we want to lower the value of that a little bit. Okay, now the whole painting is covered. We have a good base and now it's a good time to go into some details and adjustments. Uh, this tomato has some cracks coming out of the stem area, so I'm going to put those in with uh, just my drawing color, the brown, the, yellow, the burnt umber that I used in the beginning. And there's several of those. I'm also going to uh, work on the spot where the stem was attached. That area is kind of a grayish brown uh, with a yellow greenish tinge. And um, I'm just putting down some dabs until I see the color that feels right. just adjusting as I see it on the painting and not necessarily on the palette. So now I'm going to go even brighter and hit some of those shiny ribs of the tomato. I'm getting some cad yellow and white and uh, mi mixing it with the existing base color that I have. And I'm just hitting a couple of spots with it 
and just to see how it feels. The tomato is not one even color. There's lots of variations on it. There's spots that are translucent, spots that are a little bit more orange, spots that are more yellow, and there's even some places that have some green in it. So the best way to paint something like this, in my opinion, is to just mix up some colors that you see and put them down. Then take a look, compare what you've painted to what you see, find another color, and put that down. And just continue building colors like that until what you see in your subject and what you see in the painting begins to have some similarities. It might not happen right away, but over time it will. As I'm uh, adding colors, I also try to keep an eye on the forms and the overall shape of that shadow. When I uh, see something that's off or needs to be better defined, I just make those adjustments. All forms that are facing light will have a light part and a shadow part and just by defining those you can create the illusion of three dimensions. I'm going to push down those reflected lights a little bit. When you're working on reflected light, it's very easy to go overboard. A lot of new artists, when they first discover the reflected light and how it helps to make things look 3D, will over-exaggerate the brightness. And it looks amateurish and a little cartoonish. The key is not to let the reflected light go brighter than any part of the side that is directly lit. If you do, then things begin to fall apart. And the way to check that is uh, to check whether you've gone too far or not. Is to just squint and look at your subject, then look at your painting, and see if the overall shape is still there. If the reflected light light is jumping out and beginning to destroy that illusion. When I look at the surfaces that turn away from me, I notice that they don't reflect as much color as the surfaces that face me directly. Uh, so I'm using a less saturated color to paint those are areas, those edges. And this helps to push them back further into space and again create that illusion of space in three dimensions. It also helps to bring the surfaces that are facing you forward and make them feel more saturated. For every one of those ridges there is an edge that faces me and an edge that turns away. And the more of those details you're able to capture, the more realistic your painting will look. And by capture, I don't mean render all the little variations on each one of the ridges. I just mean just take some paint and put some color for the light color, put a little color for the dark color, maybe do a little accent, and that's it. You don't want to get too far into the details. As I'm looking at the shadow area that is facing me and comparing it to the subject, I notice that it's feeling a little muddy. I'm going to give it a bit more contrast and intensity with some alizarin crimson and cadmium orange. And you can quickly see that the color is too intense and dark in its pure form. 
but as you begin to mix it into the base uh, the colors that are already there it begins to look more and more natural now compare how this area looks uh, to the far right side of the tomato see how much more alive it feels by the way this uh, is a bit of an unusual tomato even for an heirloom it's called uh, a mana orange and I grew it in my little backyard garden it may be hard to tell but uh, this tomato is pretty huge I didn't weigh it but it's probably close to two pounds I'm gonna save some seeds from it and uh, plant some more next year I really like it how about you do you have a garden let me know in the comments what you're growing this year. Aside from uh, about 15 different varieties of tomatoes, I'm also growing a lot of peppers, uh, some which I have painted and posted videos of. I also have a lot of kale, lettuce, cucumbers, eggplants, melons. I even grew some ground cherries and cape gooseberries this year too. That was fun. Anyway, I just love to paint veggies that I grow. Okay, I'm starting to notice that tomato is missing some orange and some uh, intensity throughout. So I'm hitting different areas with some cadmium orange and cadmium yellow just to bring that up a little bit. I'm uh, also gonna I'm going to push back some of those reflected lights on the bottom of the tomato a little bit and reassert that overall shadow shape. It looks like the deep shadow between the cloth and the tomato need to get a little bit darker still. I'm still seeing a little bit of gesso through the initial paint layer. I'm just using a thicker version of my drawing color, uh, which is Burnt Umber and Ultramarine Blue, and just restating that line. Okay, let's work on the stem area some more. Looks like it needs to have a little bit more grayish brown in it. It's one of those parts that are not very clear what color they are. There's several different colors and textures there. Around the perimeter it's a darker crusty brown and then it gets lighter toward the middle and in the center there's a little bit of green I could look uh, very closely and try to capture all those minute details, but that would not look that good if the rest of the painting is uh, painted in a loose style. So I'm just going to try and put down some dabs of paint that match the colors that I see from far away. And those same colors and textures, uh, they also extend into the cracks that come out from the center. As I'm working on the colors, I'm uh, watching for, for how the colors I'm putting down are looking compared to the general orange color of the tomato and adjusting as I see fit. And of course, all those areas also have a light side and a dark side and there are little crevices that are darker so I'm not going to capture all of those details but maybe just provide some suggestions that sort of hint at those
that green isn't quite right. It's too intense and probably a little too dark. But I really wouldn't be able to tell that while the color is still on my palette, so I have to put it on the painting and then react from there. There's just a little bit of green which is covered by those crusts uh, of brown for the most part. As I'm painting, sometimes I'll move to another part of the painting and work on that for a while. And the decision to do so is very instinctual. As I'm working, once in a while I'll look around the whole painting and there will be an area here or there that catches my attention. And in that case, I may postpone what I've been working on and move on to that part of the painting to try to adjust things that are bothering me. In this case, I'm going to work on the background some more. It's a little bit hard to see in this video because of the glare at the top. But the background is uh, drawing a little too much attention to itself and away from the main subject. I'd like to even it out, make it a bit more opaque so the white of the gesso is not showing through as much. I'm using the same color that were there to begin with, but just bringing them all a little closer together. Generally I try to move the painting towards completion as a unit and not in little sections. There are some painters who will start on the main subject and completely render it before moving to other areas of the painting. And that's okay for some people, but I would not recommend it when you're first starting out. If you're working on a small part of painting without considering how it plays with the rest of the painting, your colors and tones may be all out of whack, but you won't know until you paint the other parts. And by that time, you spend so much time on the main subject that you don't want to go back and readjust things and lose the work that you've already put into it. But if you're keeping things loose and at the same level of finish throughout your painting, then you're more free to adjust and correct uh, as you go along. And the result is a more balanced painting. And why would you want to have a more balanced painting? Well, I think when you look at a painting, you want to feel comfortable. You want to feel like everything is in its place. So, now I'm going to mix up a little bit of a shadow color for the cloth. And I'm using some alizarin crimson. Not alizarin crimson. I'm using some ultramarine blue, some yellow ochre, and some burnt umber just to make a darker version of that color. And uh, I'm going to just draw in the darker part of the shadows. I already have a middle dark and uh, so this is going to be the kind of the darkest darks of the cloth. And any time I have the opportunity I readjust the drawing if I see any inconsistencies with what I see in the subject. Cloth is one of those things that you can spend a long time rendering and getting all the little details right, but there is a point where things begin to look like they're taking shape and really that's the point that I like to stop. I don't like to go too crazy with the details of a cloth because really it's there for just context and it doesn't require more attention than anything else. You can already begin to see how some of those folds are beginning to materialize.
here the cloth goes over the edge of the table but the table is not a, a sort of a straight 90 degree angle down there's a bit of a bevel to the table so that is picked up by the cloth as well now this area right here looks still a little mushy so I need to sort of define things very clearly I'm gonna get a little thinner brush and work out some of those details I'm gonna use a, a little bit more of that light color and even push it up even higher it's not gonna go as high as as pure white but uh, I think this is gonna be probably the lightest that this cloth will go so let's start to define those folds a little bit better and uh, this part of the cloth actually has a couple of blue lines in it but I'm not gonna worry about those just yet I want to establish the overall structure of it and then just paint the blue over it if I try to separate the blue and the white at this stage it's just gonna become a mess and it's gonna be very tedious and hard to keep those two apart so wherever I see that brighter brightest color I'm gonna apply that while I still work with it I'm gonna add a little bit of blue to this shadow where the fold, where the cloth sort of folds over but you can still see a little bit of light coming through through the fabric and on, onto the other side it's a bit of a more of a vibrant kind of shadow color so I want to try to capture that kind of like that so I'm gonna put a little bit of that blue in other places too makes the shadows look a little bit more interesting So now I'm going to mix up some blue for the the stripes on the towel. I'm going to use uh, ultramarine blue and just take some of that white, add it into it, and a little bit more, a little bit of that brown that I've been using for my drawing. A little bit more white. And just a touch of a lizard and crimson just to get a little towards the red, towards the purplish. And let's see what that looks like. Now this is kind of precise work, so what I'm doing is I'm using my other hand to stabilize my drawing hand 
by leaning a brush against the edge of the painting or, 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 or an easel and just putting my hand on top of that, that hand which is stabilized and right now I'm just painting the shadow parts of the blue which is darker and then I will go ahead and uh, paint the lighter parts And I'm just making an, a lighter version of that color and just continuing those lines down through the light. And as the blue mixes with the white, it actually, I need to add more and more pure blue to make it darker again. And then as the cloth turns, it gets darker also, so I need to adjust for that as well. And actually these kind of little details like the stripe they really do make the cloth look much more realistic especially if they follow the rules of light and shadow and I'm gonna try to make them follow those rules and if I make the, my stripes a little too wide I can always go in with the white and adjust them. Now there's also a little bit of stripe on the other side of the tomato that I can see so I'm gonna put that in as well and that actually gives the painting a little bit more dimension and depth. Just a little bit of blue on the other side really makes a difference. Cloth can be a little tricky to paint because there are so many surfaces and if they don't connect in just the right way the fabric may not look right. If you're just starting out and you're having difficulty painting fabric what I would suggest is spending some time to practice drawing it with just a pencil first. When you're working in just black and white, it's a lot easier to focus on just the structure of light and shadow. Really figure out how to depict folds in the fabric, how to depict wrinkles, what happens when the fabric is pinched, and how does it affect the rest of the fabric, and really get into the details and try to draw as realistically as possible. And over time, the more you draw like that, the more it will become second nature. You'll begin to understand what's happening with light and shadow, understand how things connect. And that makes painting much easier. It's like having a good foundation when you're building a house. I'm using a thinner sable brush now to really define what's happening with the cloth here. And I try not to use thin brushes too much when I'm painting a la prima, but sometimes I have to. The key is to only use thin brushes when it's absolutely necessary and not get carried away and go into other parts of the painting. Now, I could get much more detailed here, but that's not really my goal. I'm just going to try to get into these little sort of points and little detail areas, get those defined, and just move on. So 
so now I think I'm gonna go back to my orange brush and bring in some more of that white and since I'm working with white I suppose it's a good time to hit some of those highlights on the tomato too and when it comes to highlights I generally try to paint them where I see them there are some places that look like they should have highlights but if you don't see it in the subject uh, probably shouldn't put it in uh, it's possible to go overboard with highlights and then your subject may look too shiny or fake you also want to make sure that the right amount of white is used. Highlights are pure white only when the subject is really, really shiny. And this tomato has a bit of texture. So those highlights are muted and sort of a shade of the orange that's the base of the tomato. This back part of this is kind of interesting. Since the highlights are right by the stem, the base of the stem. A lot of times you'll need to blend the edges of the highlight a little bit uh, with the background color in order to for it not to look like a white sticker on your painting. The exception is as I mentioned before things that are really shiny like glass. I'm seeing a little bit of green in the tomato so I'm just gonna put it in and see how that looks. Sometimes you want to make a painting that idolizes the subject, meaning you paint something as you want it to be. In this case, I could choose to make the tomato very orange and fully ripe looking. Uh, in that case, I would look for the most ripe areas and try to make it look like that throughout. But I, I like these very little variations and I actually think that it makes the painting look more real and more interesting. As I'm looking at the tomato, I'm noticing that some areas are looking a little dull, so I'm going to add some bright orange in the shadow areas. Shadows can be a little tricky. It may be tempting to uh, paint the shadow like a brown color and say that it's done, but if you look at just the shadow of the subject, you notice that it looks orange just like the rest of the tomato, just darker. And to get that shadow color just right is not easy. You have to find a color that's almost the same hue but darker. That color inside of the stem base is kind of interesting. It's a very subtle green with a lot of yellow and white in it. And uh, it, it also changes as it moves around and away from the light. For the edges that are on the far side, to make them really look like they're moving away from you, you can blend the edge between the tomato and the background. If you go over the edge a few times you can really begin to see how things start to move back. And you can really push this effect and play around with it. Well, the painting is getting close to being done. Do you see any areas that need some more attention? If you want, you can pause the video, imagine that you're painting this picture and Think about what you would work on next to make it feel more complete. What do you think? Right, the table. The table feels a little transparent and not quite solid enough. I'm going to start with the same color that's already there and just make a more opaque version of that same color. From there you can push things a little bit and make the bright areas brighter and the darker areas darker. I think that's looking about right. Looks like there's light falling on the table now. But 
but I think what I want to do is make the back part of the table look like it's a little bit shiny and dusty and maybe even push it back into space a little bit and if I use a little bit of purple that should do the trick what do you think how does that feel seeing a little bit of that purple in other places of the wood as well sort of makes it feel more real yeah I like that I think I want to add some purple to the drop shadows of the tomato too uh, it'll make them look more interesting uh, than a simple dark brown and you know I'm not just making this stuff up I'm actually seeing a little bit of purple in the shadows uh, if I look very carefully but also I know that you know when you add this kind of cool colors into the shadows it begins to kind of breathe and become more interesting yeah that's making it feel a little bit more alive and real it's probably a little bit dark but if you blend the edges of the shadow uh, with the light it begins to feel much more natural the shadow is going to be more crisp when it's closest to the subject and then as it falls further away it's going to soften and begin to blend and become lighter So a few more highlights on the table and I think it feels like it's done. And uh, now is a good time to take a look at the painting overall and see if there's anything else that you'd want to do with it. What do you think? Is anything bothering you? For me the bottom edge of the tomato is looking a little bit soft and undefined so let me play around with that a little bit it's kind of a tricky area because it sort of goes from this bright reflected light all the way to almost pure black where there's no shadow I mean where there's no light and since I'm a little too far into the shadow I'm going to go back in with a dark brown and touch that up a little bit and that's the darkest part of the painting and this is where almost no light is entering I can't help myself I'm gonna go in with a small brush and hit some of those ridges on the tomato that are catching some light that I didn't capture I don't want to go overboard and start rendering all the minute details. I really like the looseness of the painting overall. I'm just gonna make some small corrections that are just hard to get it with the big brush. I'm noticing that there is a bit of a shine on the bottom part of the tomato which is different than the reflected light it's the white towel that's being reflected off of the tomato skin so I'm using a purplish beige to capture those reflections and I really have to be careful not to go overboard they're very subtle
little dab will do. So I think that's pretty good. And now, if you look at the overall shape, it looks like the tomato is developing a little bit of a kind of a hump on the left side, which it doesn't quite feel natural. And instead of getting rid of it, I'm just going to raise up the top part of the tomato and kind of accentuate it even more so that it gives the tomato a little bit more personality and character. I think this picture is just about finished. I just need to touch up the stem area a little bit. So, what did you think of this video? Did you actually watch the whole thing? Or just forward to the end to see how it turned out? I don't blame you if you did. You know, creating these videos with commentary is a fair bit amount of work. So, if you found it useful and you would like me to make more, give this video a like and leave a comment. I'll, I may try doing a narrated time-lapse version of this video in the future just to make the lesson a little bit more digestible. And so before we wrap it up a few takeaways that you should remember next time you set up a canvas and paints. Number one, keep things loose and don't get hung up on the details too early. Number two, try to get most of the canvas covered with paint quickly so you can judge colors against what's already on the canvas. And three, draw as much as you can to improve the structure of your paintings. You know, you may not always end up with a painting that you love, but that's okay. If you keep painting, your paintings will get better over time. And so I encourage you to keep at it. Now, if you like the way this painting came out, and who knows, maybe you would like to purchase it, there is a link in the description to my Etsy shop. I am going to be posting this painting there shortly after posting this video, and it may still be available as you're watching this. If not, there are many other paintings that are available in my Etsy shop, and some of them might interest you. Okay, all that is left is to sign and date the painting. I like to pick a spot that doesn't have a lot of detail. And uh, this is where that thin brush really comes in handy. Okay, until next time, this is Alex. Bye bye.